In addition to turning the other cheek, Jesus also calls his followers to live open-handed lives of compassion. A few weeks ago, I was sitting in a restaurant in, where a guy walked up to the table next to mine. There were no chairs at his table, and he looked around and then said, hey, can I have one of your chairs that you're not using? Well, I didn't care. Nobody was going to sit there. It wasn't my chair. Have you noticed how easy it is to let things go that aren't ours? If we don't own it, if we have no attachment to it, it's a very common phrase for many of us, isn't it? I don't care. It's not mine. And in this passage, Jesus is challenging us not only to not retaliate, but also to give up our rights, to keep offering reconciliation because these things are not ours in the first place. In fact, we don't own anything. We aren't entitled to anything. We don't have any rights. And if we let go of our rights, if we let go of our desires to control and dictate, then things become a lot easier. I mean, listen to what Jesus is asking of us. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. That's difficult. That's hard to hear and it's difficult to obey. Someone is suing for the inner coat, so just give them the outer one as well. Jewish law was clear that the outer coat was something that you shouldn't take from a person. And Jesus is saying, give it to him anyway. A Roman soldier could require any non-Roman citizen to carry anything for up to one mile. And Jesus is saying, don't just carry it for one mile, carry it too. And when people ask you for something or to borrow money from you and you have it within your ability to do so, do it. Well, this sounds impossible. Unless you and I look at our lives from the approach of open-handed compassion. If we start out with the idea that what is mine is mine and I have rights, then we feel slighted and taken advantage of and used and stolen from or cheated or put upon when things like this happen. I need my coat. I have to carry my own burdens. I can't be carrying that stuff for you. You never paid me back when I had to work hard for my money. It's mine. But if we approach life with open-handed compassion, we realize that everything that we have is a gift from God. That it's not mine. If we hold our attachments to things loosely, then when someone wants to take our shirt or to impose on our time and schedule by having us carry something or wants to borrow something, then since it's not really ours in the first place, it's easier to let go of them. This requires great dependence on God. It requires faith that believes God provides and will provide. If you and I take Jesus literally here, then that would leave us naked and penniless. And I don't believe that he's asking us to be careless, just open-handed and compassionate and generous. What underlies this whole section is a commitment to allow God to be in control to trust God, to let God bring the proper judgment on those who do evil to us. Once you and I have given up on our rights and property and acknowledge that God is in control, then only thing, then we, and only then can we hear the next section. You've heard it said that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He responded with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The entirety of the Torah can be summed up in love God and love your neighbor. There's a vital spiritual connection between love for God and love for our neighbor. You and I have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Every Jew knew who their neighbor was. It was their fellow Jew. And they knew that their enemy was. It was everybody else. We, too, know our neighbors. We know who they are. They are the people who think and act and feel and look and live near us. And we know who our enemies are. 
all the people who don't. We often don't even realize it. We think that we love everybody, but when we stop and listen to how we talk about those people or that person, then we realize that God is calling us to a very different kind of love. He's calling us to a radically, to radically love others. The idea of love in both Old and New Testaments is not one of emotion, and actually neither is hate. Both are concerned with action. If you love someone, you will act in ways that see to that person's well-being. You will act in ways that benefit them. And the greatest example of love, says Jesus, is when we love, when we act in ways to benefit someone who's our enemy. Jesus doesn't just ask us to love our enemies. He leads the way. The Bible tells us that at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this way, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The great act of love is not loving those who will love you back, but it is in loving your enemy and praying for those who would persecute you. Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even Gentiles do that? Jesus points out that to love those who are friends is expected, but to love enemies is to blast through the barriers that hold back the miraculous power of God in the world. Brothers and sisters, this is Jesus' hard word for us, for all who would follow him. As children of the kingdom, you and I are called to live by a different standard, not just loving those who will love us back, but loving our enemies. And what does it mean to love our enemies? It means that we don't ma badmouth them or misrepresent them or their beliefs and values. It means we do things that will bless them and their lives. It means that we will use I and thou language, respectful language, instead of I and it language, making them the lesser when referring to them. It means we forgive and pray for and treat even our enemies as we would have them treat us, even though they are not treating us that way. Imagine what it would be like if everyone reacted to their enemies with acts of love and goodwill. There would be the possibility of true justice and peace. Let's not be naive about it, though. When we react to evil and persecution with this love, it will not be something that magically makes everything better. Enemies are not going to frolic in the fields together. In fact, those who live by Jesus' words frequently end up as martyrs. Jesus being the first and prime example. But Jesus points us to a hard truth that nothing wonderful ever happens when you and I exchange good for good. But something miraculous happens when we return good for evil, when we love enemies, when we pray for those who persecute us, when we create room for God to act in our lives. When you and I retaliate and seek vengeance, we are really just trying to play God. And that is not our place. Our place is not to play God, but to reflect God. Jesus wants us to know that the God we serve is a God of grace who seeks to restore us to relationship, friend and em enemy alike. And when we seek to be reconciled to others, to live with open-handed compassion and to love radically, we reflect the very nature of God. The very nature of God that was shown to us as Jesus hung on the cross with his arms outstretched, dying, with his final breaths saying words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus, till the end, loves his enemies. Jesus, till the end, loves you and me too. Jesus ends his passage with the statement, be perfect, therefore, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. The word used for perfect is teleos. It doesn't mean to be perfect without blemish or without sin. It simply means to be mature and to be complete. 
there's something about loving our enemy and praying for those who persecute us that demonstrates perfection or completeness of God at work in us. Those who are part of the kingdom that Jesus is establishing will live a very different life than everyone else. Because we, Christ followers, have a completely different set of values. Well, let's be clear and honest. God is setting the bar very, very, very high. G.K. Chesterton once wrote, The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Nowhere is that more true than when we look back on our scripture lesson from the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, more than anywhere else, reminds us that following Jesus isn't just about signing on the dotted line and getting into heaven when we die. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is a call for our lives to reflect the character and nature of God in our everyday lives out of a transformed heart. A transformed heart that demands that we do nothing more and nothing less than to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, and to love your enemies. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.